want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Blue Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Hope you guys are having a great Saturday. It is pouring down rain here, and Lord knows we need the rain. We've had wildfires this week with 60 and 70 mile an hour wind gusts and things, and this is definitely what is needed here early in the season. So as we get going here, there has been a lot of doom and gloom on the Dallas Cowboys, and I'll be the first one to say that I have been waffling. I have been waffling all over the place, okay? I have been literally losing my mind over the Dallas Cowboys offseason. And, you know, the thing is, is it's really Groundhog Day with the Cowboys. We always hear the same kind of stuff. The Cowboys don't care about winning. You know, the, the Cowboys haven't done anything. Check the last three years. We hear the same thing over and over and over again because we just don't do anything for agency. Okay, we just don't. And we're sitting here. And we're looking at the people that we've lost. And I'm not going to say that they, these weren't productive players. But here's the thing. I, I want to actually, uh, you know, I am the optimist here, okay? I'm trying to find the positivity because everybody is mad. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be mad. Because even with what I'm going to say to you, there are things that you could look at and say the Cowboys can do better. There's... That there is a separation of the old pendulum swings too far. So the pendulum swings too far if you're the commanders because you're always out signing people because you are not good in the draft. You're just not. And so because of that, you have to go ahead and try and build a team through free agency. And you can't build a team solely through free agency. The Eagles, they're better than most team in free agency filling the roster. OK. And part of the reason why they have to do this is because they're not always hitting on the draft. OK, I, let's be clear here. You know, when you think about the first round picks of Jordan Davis, Jordan Davis, he, he was better his second year than his first year. But you think about how much they gave up to get him. That that's why they've got to go out in free agency. When you think about some of the receivers that the Eagles drafted, you know, we drafted CD lamb and we had, of course, uh, Philly 500 have a meltdown because we drafted CD lamb when they were drafting guys like Regar or, uh, uh, white Charlie Whiteside in the second round the year before. And, um, you know, you know how many wide receivers the Eagles have drafted that have been bust. So they had to make the trade for AJ Brown because they didn't find CD lamb. Now they get a good one. You know, Devontae Smith is a good one. But how many misses did they have before they got to that one? That's my point being there as part of the reason why they've had to go into free agency. Like I said, because they do it so much, they're better than most. Although you would look and say that the commanders should be masters of it because they've been doing it forever and not having it work. I mean, remember, they signed guys like Miles Austin and Deion Sanders back in the day that were complete busts, the Albert Hainsworth and so on. So that's part of the thing, a reason why the Cowboys don't go crazy in free agency. Now, here's where I want to pull up this because this is kind of important because here's where most of our losses have been. Our losses have been on the defensive front seven, okay? We've lost Leighton Van Der Esch. Leighton Van Der Esch was better than most people gave him credit for. The problem with Leighton Van Der Esch is he only played five games last year. And Leighton Van Der Esch has had injury issues. And typically when Leighton Van Der Esch came back from injuries because of your neck, you have to understand the position. Your neck is key. Your neck is key in tackling somebody, as we were always taught, although it doesn't seem like people really know how to tackle anymore. It's just like we're just trying to hit you as hard as you can and knock you down. You know, it's like weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. But if you're really into form tackling the drills that we always did at JMU and shout out to JMU Dukes winning last night and in the first round being a number 12 seed taking uh knocking out Wisconsin fifth seed go Dukes the year of the JMU Dukes 
All right, so if you're sitting here and you're thinking about tackling, what you're taught to do is get your head across the body and you're using your shoulder here and your arms to wrap up. That way, you know, with the slip jerseys that are tight and all that, they're not able to slip away. You are getting them, and you're able to squeeze. So you got to get your neck because your neck is part of that tackling. And when Leighton Van Der Esch has come back from injuries, it's taken him a while to get up to speed on that. So we played all last year without Leighton Van Der Esch. Now we bring in Eric Kendricks. Now I want you to understand, Leighton Van Der Esch's best season was his rookie year. He had 140 tackles, pro bowler. Incredible season. That made you think, oh, man, we've got the Wolf Hunter. We're good. Unfortunately, the injury shortened his career. Eric Kendricks averages about 115 yard of tackles a season. Doesn't get injured. That right there is a better move right now. Overshown, and I'm talking my man DMV and uh, E2 Blue. Overshown, here's what you got to look at. Overshone's coming back. Now, again, he had an ACL tear, but here's the good thing on the ACL tear. That ACL tear happened before the season started. Happened before the season started. So unlike Michael Gallup, who had his in January, so you think of September, October, November, December, you know, you're talking about four extra months of recovery time for him. Now, he probably will be slowed somewhat because it really takes a, a good year to get used to that and, you know, to really start trusting your leg again. But you have to look at that and say an overshown coming back is going to be better than what we had at the end of last year. And getting Damone Clark into his third year, you know, he ended up having a lot of tackles last year. But he was really the only real linebacker that you had out there. You'll be able to use him differently now that you've got Eric Kendrick as your middle linebacker. You'll be able to use him on the weak side and so on. So we'll see how that goes. So I'm not feeling worse about my linebacking core. I actually look at this and I say, I feel a little bit better at the moment right there. Now the defensive line, let's be clear. We've lost Hankins. Hankins who had three sacks, 27 tackles, and was our main run stopper. Um, saying that run stopping was not good last year, was not good. Hankins getting up there, he'll be 32 years old next year. Getting a little long in the tooth. We lost Dante Fowler, Dante Fowler, rotational guy, four sacks. You're going to miss that. Dorrance Armstrong, seven and a half sacks, right? Um, 38 tackles. Again, he's rotating in there as well. So here's the thing you have to look at, though. is part of the reason why, besides being cheap, letting those guys go is because you feel like you have replacements there. Because, see, what you have to understand about football is you need to be like an assembly line or a conveyor belt because as people get older or free agents and go, you need the next guy coming down the line to fill in. And what if, so here, here's a question for you, here, here's the thing. Shout out to Law Nation, because Law Nation is nothing but the best. He was the first one of us guys to get over 100,000, and he's been killing it. Law Nation, you see him everywhere. You know, he's on Instagram and, and um, the, the Twitter and, you know, of course, here on YouTube and stuff, and is incredible. He put out the numbers of Mozzie Smith's rookie year and Jordan Davis. Now, Jordan Davis was hurt part of the season, and Mozzie Smith didn't get that many opportunities. So, looking at the numbers, they were about the same. And part of the thing with Mozzie Smith is, we don't know what went on behind closed doors. Mozzie Smith had to lose 40 pounds, or lost 40 pounds. We don't know if that was by design, that, hey, we want you to lose 40 pounds because we want to do you something else. And I think about... Rico, um, oh man, Rico, Rico, the, the tight end that we had. I remember, um, I remember seeing him in a preseason game against the Rams at the LA Coliseum and Rico having like two of the most amazing touchdown catches in that preseason game. And he could run like a gazelle and the Cowboys said, yeah, it's great that you can run and jump and all that. But as a tight end, 
we want you to put on weight and block. He put on the weight, and I think it destroyed him. He couldn't run down the field the way he used to before, and he was okay blocker, but they wasted his talents. Mozzie Smith, you lose 40 pounds. 40 pounds is a lot of weight. The only time I lost 40 pounds was I had a flesh-eating bacteria and was in the hospital for two weeks having three operations, and I was down to like 225. <laughs> you know, I-, I wish I could get back down to 225, but it was totally different. So we don't know if him losing that weight changed him on the field. But even with that, his numbers were comparable to, as a rotational guy, to Jordan Davis. And one of the things that Dan Quinn likes to do is he likes to rotate guys. He likes to keep them, you know, keep them fresh, keep them going. So you only have so many opportunities to play. You don't have guys that are playing the whole game, so to speak, unless you're Micah Parsons. So he had limited time out on the field. What if the Cowboys are looking because now they're having him put the weight on and that you have Mike Zimmer, that Mozzie Smith has a second-year leap? We've seen guys. We saw Terrence Steele his rookie year where people wanted to push him off a bridge and said, I don't want to ever see him on the field. His second year, he was really good. What if you get that production from Ozzie Smith and he's able to take the place of an older Hankins? I'm just saying hypothetically. Let's just say, you know, maybe it's a little step down. Maybe a little step down. Or, or best case, it's a wash. It's the same. Okay, all right. What if Sam Williams, who had four and a half sacks last year as a rotational guy, who is six foot four, two sixty one, and ran a four four six forty in college. Again, gets different tutelage from Mike Zimmer. He's got the size and the physical tools. Now he just needs to be taught and given the opportunity. The reality is, he's only three sacks away from what the production was with Dorrance Armstrong. So let's say he elevates and gets more playing time and he elevates himself to Dorrance Armstrong. Okay. Right? And what if, because there's another guy out here, because the thing people don't realize is defensive ends-wise, we've had a lot. Last year we had so many it was hard to get them on the field. Chauncey Colston, who we also got when we ended up um, drafting Micah. That was the extra pick that we picked up from the Eagles. What if Chauncey Colston, who again has only had a rotational deal, had one and a half sacks last year, gets more time, what if he ends up being like Dante Fowler? Because I have to say, the guys that people are crying over right now, the guys that people are crying over right now, are guys that when we signed them, people said they're bums. People said they're bums. Don't, Don't act like you didn't. There was nobody who was excited about the Cowboys signing Dante Fowler. So what if Chauncey Golston steps into that role like Dante Fowler? Now, all of a sudden, there's not as many holes on the defense as you think. What you're now looking at is saying, I still need a couple more big bodies to go on that defensive line. It's not as bad as you think. And let's say, hypothetically, hypothetically, How many of you guys, I know a lot of you, wanted to get rid of Tyler Biotish? I know we got a Pro Bowl there. But did you honestly feel like Biotish is one of the best centers in football? Because I want you to understand something. Here's the thing. Back in my day when they used to go to Hawaii, after the season was over for the Pro Bowl, 
players wanted to go. Players wanted to go because it was Hawaii. The season was over. I got a free vacation. Now it's the week before the Super Bowl. You know, players are kind of like, eh, I don't really want to go to Orlando. It's flag football. I'd rather skip it. So sometimes you're skipping down, you know, seven, eight spot before you get to somebody that's like, yeah, I'll go. And they become a pro bowler out of default. But it's not necessarily that they're one of the best out there. Because remember, the two Super Bowl teams, they're, they're not in there. They're not there. It opens up more spots for others. But so many of you guys wanted to move on from Biotish. What if Brock Hoffman is at least as good as Biotish, given an opportunity? They seem to be high on him. Now, maybe they're just high. But if he is able to plug him in, you are looking a little bit differently when you're going into the draft. Because let's say now I think you actually have some flexibility on the offensive line that maybe Tyron Smith they're looking at and saying, we've been nursing this puppy for too many years. It's time to go ahead and you know go on. And that's hard. But understand, they've moved on from Tony Dorsett. They've moved on from Emmett Smith. They've moved on from Demarcus Ware, okay? They've moved on from a lot of people. It's just the natural progression. And one thing the Cowboys typically do is they hold on to guys too long and don't get any value back for them. So when you think about it this way, think about it this way. We traded Amari Cooper for a fifth-round draft pick. Okay? Okay. Letting go Tyron Smith is a fifth-round draft pick. There you go. So they're getting something out of return on that. And I dare say one thing about free agency is you think about the player, what they've done in the past, as opposed to what the player is now. And this is the misnomer because so many times you remember the highlights and the great things that people have done elsewhere and think that that's going to be repeated, but very rarely is that repeated. It's not to say that it doesn't, but that's more the exception than the rule. So I am now feeling actually a little bit better because if we go into the draft, we know we haven't replaced running back. We haven't addressed that at all. We don't have it on the roster. That's the draft. You get running back as one of those plug-and-play guys that you can get instant impact from. Make no mistake about it. Some positions take years to develop. Tight end is one that out the box is not something that you should expect. So you need a running back because it's like you're going to hit that hole right there. It's not as difficult. You don't. There's not as many nuances. Either you can or you can't, and that's the bottom line. So... You get a running back, and now you have the opportunity to say, okay, let's take the best offensive lineman available. If that's a guard, that's a tackle, if that's a center. If worst case, I'd, I'd rather not move Tyler Smith from guard because he's been outstanding on it. And if you have to get another starter, ultimately it would be better to get a left tackle. So you've got um, Tyler Smith there to help out the tackle as well as to help out Brock at center. But if it ends up being you've got a great guard, you can move him out to tackle. So you have some flexibility. And so this is where you can say, I'm taking the best offensive lineman that's there. Then I'm going for a running back. And maybe in this next round of free agency, you're looking at a defensive lineman. There's going to be defensive linemen that are going to be out there. And if you can get a couple of good defensive linemen, maybe another linebacker out there, this team is not that bad. Now, maybe I'm crazy, but it wouldn't be the first time. So I'm going to listen to Rich Eisen, who is feeling good about his Jets. And I have to say, it feels like deja vu that we heard that the Jets last year were going to be a Super Bowl team and that the Dallas Cowboys didn't do anything to help themselves. Right around this time yesterday that Mike Williams 
the Los Angeles Charger wide receiver of the last seven years, who is now on a free agency tour, heading to New Jersey to visit with the Jets and then having apparently a, a, a couple other teams after that. And uh, he's on a tour. And uh, he's trending. And I'm thinking, did the Jets sign him? No. He was only still on the way to New York. It was the trending subject matter surrounded a breakfast sandwich. A breakfast sandwich that apparently a New York Jet fan from Princeton, New Jersey, who goes by the handle of at NYJ underscore Matt. Nice. Decided to order a breakfast sandwich for him. Nice. Mike Williams, hey, if you're gonna if you're gonna be checking out the Jets facility, the old training center, I'm gonna send you a Taylor ham and two eggs and cheese sandwich from a nearby spot, I believe in Morristown, New Jersey. Does that uh, geographically make sense yes, to you, Mike? Okay, very sandwich. good. And uh, he even tweeted out the screen grab of right what there. looked like a what was that a a DoorDash or an Uber Eats or something like that. <laughs> It's kind of funny, you know, New York funny. Jet fans saying, hey, the least I can do to try and tip the scales right. in the Jets' favor <laughs> that didn't tip in their favor the year before when the Chargers signed him with a 3 or $60 million deal so he didn't hit the free agent market as the Jets were interested in Mike Williams then. Hey, maybe it's a breakfast sandwich. Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> well, sure yeah. enough, guess what happened? By the end of the day, the Jets did the typical... Free agent, when you really want to move, you make sure he doesn't leave the building. Mm -hmm. And they signed him to a deal, one year, $15 million, and God bless the Jets with their sense of social media press, uh, savvy. Very good. They gave him the sandwich at the signing <laughs> and then recorded it. Am I trying this right now? <laughs> well, you want to. You don't have to. No, I'm not. I'm kind of hungry, little <laughs> Steve. I'd say like a bite or something. Oh, my God. Hope it's not nasty. Ooh. It's good. <laughs> it's good. It sounded amazing. This one got the deal sign right here. Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Jerry, get some food. Got bro. the deal signed. That sandwich had to be a little bit old, right? Probably wasn't that warm. Uh, and, and this is the new profile pic <laughs> of the sandwich. That's classic. With a Mike Williams bite. Right. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's Mike sure. on the shore. Yeah, on the yeah, show. show. Back in the day. New profile pick for the Jets, and as if that that's good. not enough. Yeah, I know. That does look good. It's the, the story of the traveling bag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mike Williams went to the Nets game last night and brought the bag with him. Ouch. Oh, uh, I saw that he was at the game. <laughs> he got the bag. the bag. That's a new thing. I'm huh? assuming that's the bag. Oh, I, 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 wow. I, I'm assuming it's the bag in question. The that's bag in question looked larger <laughs> with a more green uh, label. I, unless, I don't know if somebody's handing him a, a replica of the bag. But Wow. So is that going to be Jets fans thing? They bring brown yeah. paper bags and then the, the, the Jets team fans team need to care, keep a bag, or, yeah. ah, or or you breathe into it. Uh, yeah, Hyper when rattling. things get nervous, I went the unknown comic route. Okay, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, Hoskins, you know what I'm asking you to call up. You, if you really want to take a look at a team that knows what it's doing in free agency, uh, don't look at the Jets. Oh, here you go. I'm sorry, you just walked into it with the paper bag slag. I mean, but it's just that like, rhymes. Man, oh my gosh. Let's see. Let's what do my eyes up. see? Here it comes. Oh, let's look. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's what a team that knows how to work the free agency Still board and fill the, fill the blanks to set you oh, up for the. Uh, boy. For the, for the draft, deal, that's a team right there, the Dallas Cowboys. Jordan and interestingly Lewis. enough, Respect Rico. it's Respect funny Rico. that you bring that up, uh, mm -hmm. TJ, because you, right, you kind of walked me into my next point, which is the one-year $15 million deal that they did for Mike Williams. And then you add to the fact how they've redone their offensive line mm -hmm. with the centerpiece being a one-year deal for a guy named Tyron Smith. And when it was one year, 20 million bucks, you know, there's the up to 20 million bucks. Mike Flory had a funny tweet yesterday saying, 
quote unquote up to is doing a lot of mad work this week or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Up to 20 million bucks. Dallas Cowboys friends went, ah, well, one year 20 million bucks. I mean, we don't have the free agency wait to keep our future Hall of Fame left tackle to protect Dak. We we just had to let him walk for that. And then you see the details. It's really only six. And, and you million. see only six and a half million bucks is the guaranteed money. And the rest of it are incentives for a guy that has had some games missed. Last year was one of his healthier seasons in recent memory, and he missed yeah. four games. He missed 13 and 22, 6 and 21, and 14 and 20. And the last time he played an entire season start to finish without missing a game was 2015. So the Jets protected themselves financially by signing him to a deal one year, six and a half million bucks, that once that came out, do you know what hit the Metroplex? The realization that the cash strapped, let's re-sign our long snapper Cowboys mm -hmm. could have kind of fit Tyron Smith into the mix after all. But didn't. So maybe you want the paper bag. No, I mean. All right. We've I'll got, just, how about this? We've got we'll three, three wins this. the last three years. The Jets year. have how 18, about this? How about 18 this? wins, Chris. How about this? One eight. I'll keep 18. the paper bag. I'll keep the paper bag for September through December mm -hmm. and then hand it to you for January. Won't need it. Oh, yeah, because, because you, won't be, you won't be playing in no, January. No, I won't need so it. So you won't need I the won't bag. need it because the January that the January that the Jets – Hopefully, we'll make. Is your make, quarterback going to play a full game be, this season? Like a full game. Hopefully, it will be <laughs> such house money. I won't need the paper bag because the Jets oh, you're have need everything the paper bag in free to go agency over your head. and didn't break the bank doing it. Neither did we. And they did a very. All right, we're going to leave it right there, good people. We will revisit this next year because every year it's the Jets. Oh my God, the Jets, the Jets, the Jets. All right, good people, have a great day. Peace out.